So I have here with me today Smith Tackers, and we're talking about writing clean abstractions, right? Yep. Perfect. So take it away. All right, people, let's get started. So yeah, as she introduced me, I'm Smith, and I currently live in Dubai. Uh, and I work for uh, a biggest classifieds company in Dubai called Dubizel. And today I'm here to talk about, as you can see, writing clean abstractions. So abstraction is somewhat abstract topic. So I will try to make it more concrete for you and give you tips on how to write clean abstractions. Um, so at Dubizel, I take care of uh, uh, building highly scalable and resilient infrastructure with infrastructure as code uh, as a platform engineer and also focus on building tooling for developer productivity. Uh, you can find more about me on my LinkedIn or GitHub. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So to start with, uh, if you were to explain someone what is an abstraction, just, to, just so that we all of us are on the same page, I would say uh, in layman terms, abstraction is a way to say to your clients, give me the gist of what you want to do and let me worry about the details of how. If you are a client of abstraction, you trust the provider to handle the details correctly. Uh, so wh why to abstract? Because abstractions give you leverage. Leverage is a term that comes from a physical lever, which uh, let me move a huge object, which I couldn't possibly move without a lever to amplify my force. Similarly, abstractions hide the low level details. This is called encapsulation and allow us to develop more and more complex systems. One of, one of the classic example is this abstraction tower. The abstraction towers shown in the example uh, uh, shows us how building abstractions on top of each other have enabled us to do really complex stuff. So for instance, uh, uh, here, is an, uh, here you can see assembly language is an abstraction of machine learning code, which is uh, in hexadecimal, which is an abstraction of signals controlling the complex integrated circuit which abstracts the components built out of gates, where gate is an abstraction of certain arrangement of transistor. And we can go on and on about it. Someone who studied transistors in college may, may be able to tell us what transistors are abstracting on and so on. So before we talk about good or bad abstractions, uh, let's understand the characteristics of abstractions. So I like to think about uh, things as strong and weak abstractions. A strong abstraction encapsulates a lot of complexity, and this is not necessarily a good thing. There are many times when you don't want to hide a ton of complexity. Conversely, a weak abstraction encapsulates very little complexity. Uh, and here, term weak doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Sometimes you actually need people to get down to the nuts and bolts of what you're providing them, because that's what they need in order to build something uh, on top of your API or, a plat or your platform. Um, another characteristic of uh, abstractions is that they all leak and uh, we have to live with that fact. Uh, by leak, I mean uh, you need to know uh, sometimes uh, the underlying detail to build on top of it. Some of the common example can be a two-dimensional array or SQL or NFS, something as simple as iterating a large two-dimensional array can have a radically different performance if you do it horizontally rather than vertically, depending on the grain of the wood. One direction may result in vastly more page faults uh, than the other direction, and page faults are slow. The SQL language, uh, the second example is SQL. So the SQL language is meant to abstract the way the procedural steps uh, that are needed to query the database. Instead of allowing you to defi define merely what you want to do and let, let database figure out how uh, out the procedural steps to query it, uh, but so in some cases, uh, certain SQL queries are 1,000 times lower than another uh, logically equivalent queries. Uh, you're not supposed to uh, have to care about the procedure, only the specification, but sometimes the abstraction leaks and causes horrible performance. And you have to break down the query plan analyzer and study what you did wrong and figure out how to make the query run faster. Uh, this is another example of a leaky abstraction can be NFS, uh, even though network libraries like NFS and SMB let you treat files on remote machines as if they were local, sometimes the connection becomes very slow and goes down and the file stops acting like it was local. And as a programmer, you have to write code to deal with, the, uh, with this. The abstraction of remote file is same as local file uh, and it leaks. Um, that being said, uh, things can uh, come crashing down if you do, do abstractions wrong. 
uh, if abstractions are not done uh, right, the side effect of abstractions can be you introducing a technical debt to support backwards compatibility, or you might end up rewriting abstraction, in which case you will break the backwards compatibility. You need to think carefully when we design the abstractions or you will end up spending time to, uh, spending time to clean up the mess in your code base. Uh, so what do we do? Um, uh, so we should think uh, and analyze before we go ahead and make changes in the code and write clean abstractions. So uh, before we, before I talk more about, uh, you know, uh, how to write clean abstractions, let's understand what are bad abstractions and how they are formed. Um, uh, I know it's not patriotic to use Java snippet in Python conference. It's just the static typing help to deliver better example. Rest assured, I have Python examples in the future slides. Um, so here, uh, so I wanted to have this interactive, but unfortunately, I think the audio is one way only. So the question was that which which uh, uh, side, uh, left or right, uh, looks more cleaner and you think it's a good abstraction. Um, in my opinion, it's the left. Why? Uh, I don't think there is a, a question because uh, because the second one is a complete mess. Uh, if I look at the second one, there are uh, questions uh, that pop up in my mind, like connect to what? What is uh, what in the world is alt? Why do some mutators return nothing uh, and others return bool? Why does close have a boolean to tell it whether or not you want to close? Of course you do, uh, or you don't, wouldn't call close. Why are there two deletes that require substantially different information? Is one better somehow? What does that thing files do? Why does only uh, add want only some fields. Notice the core of, uh, core of the objection has to do something with the abstraction respectively. Uh, for example, there is open and close, but no method uh, for connect. So it's a complete mystery what this does and if you should use it. The second overload of alt adds a mysterious uh, parameter that seems to indicate this uh, overload uh, is some kind of consolation prize method or something, meaning a possible temporal dependency. There appears to be some ad hoc mixture of exception or error code handling. Uh, close wants a state flag. You need to keep track of the thing's internal state for it. It's inappropriate intimacy. In, inappropriate, by the way, inappropriate intimacy is a code smell that describes the method has too much intimate knowledge of another class uh, or methods, inner working, inner data, etc. Then does this interface want ad hoc primitives or first class objects? It can't seem to make up its mind what defines a customer. Uh, the file so stuff makes it seem like a class is a database access class retrofitted awkwardly for a corner, uh, corner case involving files, which is completely different ball game. The rest of the operations have at least one overload that deals with customer, but add doesn't, indicating add is somehow different than other code operations. Um, so how are bad abstractions formed? Like we developers are not evil. We don't want to uh, write code uh, that could possibly, you know, uh, provide bad interface to our clients, right? So how, how are they formed? Um, as you can see in this example, uh, existing code has powerful influence. Its very presence argues that it's both correct and necessary. We know uh, that code represents effort extended and we are very motivated to preserve the value of this effort. And unfortunately, the sad truth is that more complicated and in, uh, uh, comprehensible code, deeper the investment in creating it, the more we feel pressure to retain it. Uh, this is uh, uh, like saying sunk co cost fallacy. Uh, which refers to the fallacy of honoring the sunk cost, which uh, decision th theoretically should have just been ignored. It's as if our unconscious tells us goodness, that's so confusing. It must have taken ages to get it right. Surely it's really important. It would uh, be a sin to let all that effort go to waste. When you appear in this story in step eight above, in, in above, uh, this pressure may compel you to proceed forward is that to just implement a new requirement by changing the existing code. Attempting to do, do so is however virtual. The code uh, no longer represents single common abstraction, but has instead become a condition laden procedure with, which interleaves a number of vaguely associated ideas. It's hard to understand and easy to break. If you find yourself in such situation, please resist being driven by the sunk cost. When dealing with wrong abstraction, the fastest way is uh, back. 
the fastest way forward is back do following reintroduce uh, duplication by inlining the abstracted code back into every caller within each caller use the use the parameters being passed to determine the subset of inline code that this specific caller executes delete the bits that are needed for this particular code and yeah will pre prevent from prevent the formation of a bad abstraction so how can i go around building a good abstraction well uh, uh, there are certain points you can keep in mind or you know i would call it a checklist maybe so the first thing you should do is identify your data flow and primitives then define the methods that are essential to do all required operations then another characteristic of a good abstraction is to have safe defaults every good abstraction have safe defaults so uh, for the ease of use take anything from dbs to web framework like django and flask and text editors which are the best example they are simple enough to be easily adapted by newbies but are customizable enough by advanced user uh, so yeah uh, uh, have safe defaults and then build layers on top of uh, the abstraction for further common operations uh, and then last but not least uh, follow the sid principle uh, from solid which comes in handy while designing the software um, so i'm going to emphasize a bit on uh, sid uh, which is uh, uh, single responsibility interface segregation and de dependency inversion. So, uh, by SID, I mean, you know, the SID principle says that a class should have one and only one reason to change. One class should only serve one purpose. This does not imply that each class should have only one method, but they should all relate directly to the responsibility of the class. A client should not be forced to implement an interface that it doesn't use. This means uh, that we should break our interfaces into smaller ones, uh, so they better satisfy the exact needs of our clients. Similar to single responsibility principle, the goal of interface segregation principle is to minimize the side uh, consequences and repetition by dividing the software into multiple independent parts. Uh, depend on the abstractions, not on uh, concursions by applying the dependency inversion the modules can be easily changed by other modules just changing the dependency module and high level module will not be affected by the changes to the low level module well that being said uh, let's uh, take a small example of uh, uh, sid uh, so i try to come up with a, a more real world and a pythonic example that we can all relate to uh, well, I, I stole some uh, snippets and uh, also just mapped uh, uh, mapped how uh, the Redis Pi is written because I found it quite beautiful and well abstracted. So, as you can see here in the init method, uh, it has safe defaults with ability to have fine grained control for the configuration of Redis. You can see here that. Uh, we are using a lot of inheritance where in extension is required. Another thing I would like to point is, please always differentiate between abstract and non-abstract class. I've seen this a lot. People instantiate the base class, uh, which is overridden uh, a million times in the code base. And then, uh, you know, that damn method uh, that is in instantiating the base class always breaks uh, for no reason. So it's better to prefix the uh, abstract classes uh, with something like base. For, for instance, here we have uh, something called a base parser. Uh, uh, yeah, and the, uh, because it clearly indicates that it is only meant for inheritance and it must not be instantiated. Another thing uh, we can always see uh, things are abstracted out with SID principles in mind. All these classes we follow, uh, we see they follow single responsibility principle and they use composition or dependency injection to work with each other. Okay, so what is composition? In another, uh, it is another object oriented programming approach. Uh, we use it when we use want to use uh, some aspect of another class without promising all the features of that other class. In my opinion, dependency injection is quite similar to composition. The only difference is uh, when class B is composed by class A, uh, class A instance owns the creation and control or controls the lifetime of class B. Whereas in dependency injection, we inject the instance of class B from outside. You can see we pass the instance of connection pool into the Redis client. Example of uh, composition would be 
uh, based on the availability of high redis we are swapping the parsers as you can see here uh, and uh, another example would be the connection class based on the uri we are setting the connection class in both ca cases we are creating the instance inside the class well uh, that covers up uh, the sid and uh, i think i went too fast but uh, that's all i had to present any questions hello hello yeah you you still have 15 minutes left um let's see then so well thank you very much yeah and we have our first question very good so thomas is asking how to balance abstraction which is complexity and flexibility which it, which introduces complexity uh can you repeat the question again yes so how to balance abstraction which um mm. sorry which eases complexity and flexibility which introduces complexity so how to balance between um how to balance abstraction um, and flexibility? Um, so uh, what I would do is uh, I would clear a layer of abstraction. So I'll create uh, one class with just the primitives uh, and then uh, for the common operations uh, for the ease of use, I would create another layer on top. That way, if someone wants to uh, touch the low level details, he can use the primitives. And if someone wants to perform the common operation for the ease of use, I would uh, use the layer above uh, the primitive class. Uh, and also, yeah, safe defaults can also give you ease of use. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. I think it does, very good. And then we have another question from Jill. So Jill is asking, do you know it? Sorry. Do you know any good examples of code following this, uh, following Python projects? Yeah, you showed uh, JavaScript code in the middle of a Python conference. My goodness. No, I, I also took, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that, guys. Uh, I, I'm really sorry. Uh, the, uh, the Redis uh, client of Python is is really good example. Another thing uh, which I found uh, pretty beautiful was uh, the requests library. Uh, I think uh, they are just reading the code uh, uh, there would give you a really good idea. And since you are a Pythonist, you have the context uh, of you know uh, how these things work, so you will be able to relate stuff also and understand the code easily. Perfect, thank you. Uh, yes, very good. So we have another question. Um, can you say something more about refactoring incorrectly created abstractions towards something more flexible? Refactoring incorrectly? Uh, yes. So ref how incorrect refactoring create abstractions towards something more flexible? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Like incorrect re refactoring uh, would create abstractions towards more flexible abstractions? I think that's what he's asking. So the literal question is, can you say something more about ref about refactoring incorrectly created mm -hmm. abstractions towards something more flexible? Um, yeah, sometimes what I've noticed that uh, the, uh, maybe you are too generic and uh, it becomes too complex either for the users who are trying to use that abstraction, uh, but you thought oh, with genericness in mind. so. I don't know, like you should have a balance between genericness uh, and what you are trying to achieve. Maybe just limit your scope to s certain use cases that you are trying to solve. Don't try to solve all the possible things that come to your mind. Sometimes uh, I, I see that, you know, uh, we, we don't keep business context in mind. We just try to, you know, uh, solve every possible scenario. And I think that that's what leads to way too flexible and way too generic abstraction, which brings in a lot of complexity. While refactoring, uh, does that answer your question? Mm, cool. So uh, we're waiting to see if he replies on Discord, or to see if that answers the question. Because we we're we're all confused a little bit by the question. Don't worry. Mm. Uh, well, perfect. For now, the questions are over. Thank you very, very much. And uh, there's still people typing. So I'll give you, it, this is the last call for questions. Uh, 
Okay. So uh, Jill is trying to understand exactly what Powell asked beforehand. Uh, so restructuring the question and we think it would be something like um, how bad refactoring could lead to a worse design. So a less flexible design, but uh, you answered that question pretty well. So it's all right. Uh, cool. So any more questions at all? Dun, 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 dun. Mm, nope, it doesn't seem like it. Well, thank you very, very much. <laughs>